A 2016 news story in The Guardian looked at the impact of social media during the 2011 uprising in Egypt. The story shared, On 25 January 2011, hundreds of thousands of protesters started to gather in Tahir Square and planted the seeds of unrest, which, days later, finally unseated the incumbent president, Hosni Mubarak after 30 years of power. The story continued. During 2011, the term Arab Spring became interchangeable with Twitter uprising or Facebook revolution, as global media tried to make sense of what was going on. But despite Western media's love affair with the idea, the uprisings didn't happen because of social media. Instead, the platforms provided opportunities for organization and protest that traditional methods couldn't. In the words of one protester, Fawaz Rashid, we use Facebook to schedule the protest, Twitter to coordinate, and YouTube to tell the world. Since 2011, we've witnessed the positive impact of social media in several industries. We've observed restaurants gain popularity and fame from customer reviews on Yelp. We've seen donations to worthy charities spike through social media, such as the 2019 Ice Bucket Challenge to support ALS research. New businesses and products found life because of social media sites like GoFundMe. There are dozens of examples like these. In December 2019, the Pew Research Center published a report titled 10 Tech-Related Trends That Shaped the Decade. Number one on the list was this finding. Social media sites have emerged as the go-to platform for connecting with others, finding news, and engaging politically. However, less than one year later, in August 2020, Pew published another report titled 55% of U.S. social media users say they are worn out by political posts and discussions. The report stated, Americans who use social media sites are also more likely today than in 2016 to describe the political discourse on these platforms in negative terms. 7 in 10 now say they find it stressful and frustrating to talk about politics on social media with people they disagree with up from 59% in 2016. And the new survey also finds that social media users generally do not find common ground as a result of online discussions about politics. Roughly 7 in 10 users, 72%, say that discussing politics on social media with people they disagree with usually leads them to find out they have less in common politically than expected while 22% report finding out they have more in common politically than previously thought. Is this apparent decline in connection and engagement because of social media? Or was this decline inevitable and social media brought issues that have always existed to the forefront? What is social media? What are the issues and consequences around social media? How does social media fit into the area of digital media ethics? What is social media? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary tells us social media is forms of electronic communication, such as websites for social networking and microblogging, through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content such as videos. Wikipedia describes social media like this. Social media are interactive computer-mediated technologies that facilitate the creation or sharing of information, ideas, career interests, and other forms of expression via virtual communities and networks. The variety of standalone and built-in social media services currently available introduces challenges of definition. However, there are some common features. Wikipedia suggests that common features include interactive applications, user-generated content, user-created profiles maintained by the social media organization, and facilitation of social networks. 
We've witnessed good consequences likely because of social media's presence, including providing the ability for people to connect, share, publish, organize, enhance activism, and profit. Social media helped bring to light injustice, crimes in progress, and real-time alerts of disasters and safety measures. Social media platforms help bring funding to ideas, movements, and social causes for the common good. And social media supported individual prosperity and fresh ways of making a living through self-publishing and promotion. We've used social media to stay connected to those we may not have otherwise been able to, if not for social media. We've also experienced other consequences because of social media's viral and broad-reaching characteristics, including cyberbullying, harassment, stalking, mass spreading of false news and misinformation, and privacy and data sharing breaches and concerns. In July 2020, Washington called executives from Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook to testify before Congress as part of investigations of competition in the digital marketplace. In that same month, the Pew Research Center published a report showing a majority of Americans think social media companies have too much power and influence in politics, and roughly half think major technology companies should be regulated more than they are now. If social media and tech companies become problematic and out of control, do we understand the technology and the consequences of it? Is there a need to slow social media's reach and regulate this industry? It's difficult to weigh the positive effects of social media against the serious negative consequences. Social media appears to have a significant effect on adults, business, and public discourse. And what about young adults and children? Has the infusion of social media and technology into all parts of our lives made it impossible to raise children and shield and protect them from harm during their important years of physical and cognitive development? In her text, The Cyber Effect, an expert in cyber psychology explains how technology is shaping our children, our behavior, and our values, and what we can do about it. Mary Aiken, Ph.D., tells us about the effects of social media on teens. Aiken suggests, because teenagers, as well as children, can display narcissistic-type traits due to the simple fact that their sense of self or self-concept is still being formed. They can seem to be uncaring about others because they are distracted by the work of creating an identity. Teenagers will try on new selves and new clothes and new hairstyles to the point of total disengagement with anything else going on in their family life or home. For a teenager, this sort of experimentation, along with risk-taking, is one way that identity is formed. Going too far is part of the process, almost a requirement. Who am I today? Who do I want to be tomorrow morning? They look for answers in the feedback they receive from their peers. And today, to a greater and greater degree, this feedback happens online, not just from their friends, but in free online astrological profiles, personality questionnaires, and a plethora of phone apps that will analyze their handwriting, music tastes, food preferences, and even bathing styles. Aiken asks, Teenagers are consumed by their own reflections, in other words, hoping to figure out who they are. What happens when the bathroom mirror, where teens used to stare at themselves, is replaced with a virtual mirror, a selfie that they just took with their phone? What resources can help us better assess social media? We've heard of things we can do to assess digital news, actions such as separating facts from opinions, identifying news versus opinion pieces, identifying false facts, fake news, and misinformation. With news, we can find multiple and credible sources, identify the goals, motives, and funding sources of the producers of the news, and verify the facts. Can we use these same approaches for social media? Are there other considerations? It appears social media isn't vacating our culture soon. It's here to stay. How can we use social media to better serve our culture, communities, and ourselves?